All right, let's turn to section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants. As opposed to another book that's section, as sections, okay. I realize I probably didn't need the of the Doctrine and Covenants appended there. All right. Uh, the NC 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants is actually section 4. Brock talked about this earlier, that it was more thematically organized. In the original DNC, the priesthood heavy sections were up front. Um, of course, section one, the introduction, got the first slab up. Then it went organization and priesthood, priesthood, priesthood. Uh, yeah, right. So Joseph has now moved to uh, the New K. Whitney store. Him and his wife are now living here. Why are they living here? Oh, okay, that's interesting. I forgot a little piece I need to do from, uh, from last time. Check this out. Uh, let me open that back up. I didn't know where to put this, so I'm going to put it right here, right now. One more historical note I was going to add. So why does Joseph move away from Hiram, Ohio, and go back to Kirtland? Here's why. Um, in the midst of all of these sections happening and Joseph traveling to Missouri and coming back, something happened right here that will explain his move. That is the uh, tarring and feathering in Hiram, Ohio. Mm -hmm. The one that's on the movie. Mm -hmm. That one. Uh, you know about that evening. Sidney Rickton had a home across the street. Joseph and Em was there. Joseph is attending one of his twins. Um, he's kind of laying in bed with one of the twins, little Joseph. Joseph and Julia Murdoch Smith, and uh, someone taps on the window, probably to make sure they're asleep, and a mob of about maybe 50 or less. Um, some of them bust in, super strong uh, people. The strongest one who says he could take Joseph single-handedly uh, approaches Joseph as he's being held. Joseph kicks him in the face, and he goes flying. Uh, and then later he gets a hold of Joseph. He said Joseph was the strongest man he ever he ever laid his arms on. Uh, you know about that. You know about the evening. We'll go into the gory details in history of the church. Joseph explains it really well. Simon's rider was there, um, so he's now out of the church and inciting mob action. He wouldn't meet Sidney Rigdon for public debate, but he will. For tarring and feathering. He, he, he'll be there for the evening tarring and feathering of Joseph and Sidney. Uh, that's when Sidney gets drug on his head for about 50 yards, and he's never quite the same afterwards. Kind of trauma-induced bipolarism. Uh, Philo Dibble, he says, When I arrived at Father John Johnson's the next morning, Joseph and Sidney had just finished washing up from being tired and feathered the night before. Joseph said to Sidney, We can now go on our mission to Jackson County alluding to a commandment given them while they were translating, which they concluded not to attend to until they had finished that work. Wait, remember this? Whoosh. Shall we finish the translation of the New Testament before we go to Zion? Or wait till we return? Whoosh. There should be no delays. Wherefore, omit the translation for the present time. Whoosh. They concluded not to attend uh, to that journey until they had finished that work. It is possible that the tarring and feathering happens because of slowness to obey the command to go to Missouri. Or in other words, the Lord was trying to get them out of there before that happens. But it happens. Um, and uh, it's one of the sad church episodes history in church history. Significantly different. Yeah, if Sydney, Sydney was, was if Sydney was clear possibly headed. Yeah. Crazy. yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, this this forever changes church history. Um so when they get back, obviously Joseph Smith does not want to live in Hiram, Ohio. Uh, this does what the mob wanted it to do. They, they ran him out of town. And so he goes now back to Kirtland, which is about 30 miles away, uh, 30 miles north-ish of uh, Hiram. And so that, that is that. So that, anyway, is a long story as to why Joseph is now in Kirtland. And he's living up in... Uh, the second floor of Newell K. Whitney's store. There's a room in the back here where Joseph and Emma stay. Over here, this window is the translation room. So he now he has a new translation room instead of being in the that Hiram home. Now it's right there. This is where they'll do more work on the JST, 
uh, several conferences here. This was the conference center for some time, right here. So, context of 84, uh, several others had returned home from missions to the eastern states and had given reports of their several stewardships in the Lord's Vineyard. Joseph wrote that while together in these seasons of joy, I inquired of the Lord and received on the 22nd and 23rd of September the following revelation on priesthood. Uh, there were six elders who were there on that September 22nd, and then there were 11 high priests the next day. Uh, one part of the revelation, the very beginning, says six elders, right, in verse 1. And then uh, over in verse 40, 42, it says 11 high priests. Do you see it? Right there in verse 42, do you see that? Look really carefully. Mm -hmm. you see it? <laughs> Let me pull it up. Uh, if they took it out of the uh, current edition. Let me pull up the, uh, I think I put it in here somewhere. Right. Yeah, there it is. The original text of verse 42 says that is all those. The Which eleven high priests save priest. one. Yeah. Used to say that. They took that out for flow. So by by so we think that it's verses one through forty one or forty two that was received on one day, and then forty two or forty three onward was received the next day. Two different groups, six elders on one day, eleven high priests the next. Uh, turn your neighbor and say, That's interesting. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, now, Evan Green, who was there, he was one of the six elders on day one. He was 18-year-old uh, elder in attendance. Uh, his journal, he sometimes would talk about this occasion. He said that he witnessed, quote, the glory which shone upon Joseph's countenance, and he heard the exquisite cadence of the voice in which he spoke. He recalled that as Joseph rose from his knees and began dictating, Oliver Cowdery entered the room and sat near the fire. The others sat as if transfixed, watching and listening. Oliver asked, boys, have you got that written? But no one had thought of writing it down. In characteristic fashion, Oliver puts his pen to paper and scribes for the prophet. Joseph made a few corrections as he read it back to him. But this is that's how we get section 84. Evan Green witnessed the process. Uh, here we go. Section 84 is rich and beautiful and doctrinally powerful. Um, this is both the very first temple revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants and the very first priesthood revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, that's like, teaches the doctrine of priesthood. We've got a little bit of priesthood offices already in section 20, but this is the first that, that attempts to explain the doctrine of the priesthood. It's interesting that it tries to explain the doctrine of the priesthood at the very same time as teaching the doctrine of temple. These two converge together right here in section 84, the doctrine of temple, the doctrine of priesthood. Uh, in fact, I think it would be wise for all of us to never try to teach these apart from one another. The Lord is modeling here. Uh, you know, we, we separate our understanding of priesthood and understanding of temple to our own peril. Uh, to the peril of our understanding God's purposes, to, our, to the peril of, of uh, being able to really understand what God is trying to do to us and how He's trying to do that. Um, as you talk about priesthood, I mean, from day one, I, I, with my students, I'll say, hey, from John the Baptist to Elijah in the Kirtland Temple, every aspect of priesthood restoration was about the temple and try to show that and demonstrate that to them. This section gives us the framework to talk about these things a little better. So, uh, from the very beginning, look at uh, the very first verses. The Lord <coughs> uh, talks about verse... One, the six elders united their voice. He's pleased with them. Verse 2, the word of the Lord to the church established in the last days for the restoration of His people, for the gathering of His saints to Mount Zion, the city of the New Jerusalem, which is where He's really clear, reiterates what He said back in section 57. It's the center place is the temple lot pointed out by the finger of God in the western boundaries, the state of Missouri, right there, dedicated already by Joseph Smith and others. Verse 4, Verily this is the word of the Lord, that the city New Jerusalem shall be built by the gathering of the saints. Joseph would teach that the purpose of gathering the saints is always to build temples. You gather to build. Beginning at this place, Jackson County, Missouri, even the place of the temple, which temple shall be reared in this generation 
That's pretty declarative. For verily this generation shall not all pass away until a house shall be built unto the Lord. In Jackson County, Missouri. And a cloud shall rest upon it, which cloud shall be even the glory of the Lord, which shall fill the house. Pause. So we know the plans were drawn up. Right? We've seen these plans. There's going to be a complex here of 12 temples. We know about that. We also know that that didn't happen. <laughs> this generation. This generation. The answer is no. It did not happen. In fact, today, as we know, it's going to be even more complicated if you ever want to build there because we don't own much of that. We own a piece of it, but we don't know the whole thing is kind of crammed in with a bunch of different you know, people that want a piece of the pie. So what do we do with this prophecy? What do you do with this prophecy? This is a problematic prophecy. It's a prophecy that never came to pass. This generation, right? None in this generation. Well, this generation shall not all pass away. We're talking about those that are alive at the time of Joseph Smith. Last I checked, everyone who ever lived in Joseph Smith's day is dead, every one of them. And there's still not a temple in Jackson County, Missouri. What do you do with that, friends? You check your footnotes, that's what you do. You mark footnote 4C, okay? This is what you do, and then you turn to that footnote. Okay, let's do this real quick. This is, this is a little bit of damage control, all right? So let's go to section 124. Let's go to verses 49. Through 54. So this is in Nauvoo. Uh, Joseph is still concerned about getting Missouri back. He's been to the President of the United States. He's asked Martin Van Buren to help. He, he's done everything in his power to try to involve the government, to appeal to the Constitution, to get some help in, in restoring the lands that were stolen from them and they're kicked out on, which we haven't talked about yet because it's in the future. But this is all in the past by Section 124. And so Concerning, uh, the Lord announces the building of a new temple in Nauvoo and then seems to give it, maybe in that context, knowing that the saints would probably want an explanation about the Missouri temple because that one was supposed to be built, but now there's a new temple to be built. And the Lord says this, Verily I say unto you, that when I give a commandment to any of the sons of men to do a work unto my name, and those sons of men go with all their might and with all they have to perform that work and cease not their diligence, and their enemies come upon them and hinder them from performing that work, Behold, it behooveth me to require that work no more at the hands of the sons of men, but to accept of their offerings. And the iniquity and the transgressions of my holy laws and commandments will I visit upon the heads of those who hindered my work, the Missourians, unto the third and fourth generation, so long as they repent not and hate me, saith the Lord God. Therefore, for this cause, this is a huge verse, have I accepted the offerings of those whom I commanded to build up a city and a house unto my name, in Jackson County, Missouri, and were hindered by their enemies, saith the Lord your God. And I will answer judgment, wrath, indignation, wailing, anguish, gnashing of teeth upon their heads, the enemies' heads, unto the third and fourth generation if they don't repent. And this I make as an example to you, a consolation. So the Lord says, I require it no more at your hands. Uh, the Lord effectively and officially rescinded the DNC 84 commandment here in section 124. We are no longer under obligation to build the Missouri temple. For some reason that belief has persisted that one day we will. And that might be the case. We might one day build a temple there, but not because section 84 commands it, because that command has been rescinded. Uh, there's no longer a requirement for us to ever gather to Missouri. That's not a thing anymore. Okay. Um, there, that still persists though in the church. People still talk about that. That was rescinded right here. Uh, Joseph Smith, two days after this, uh, Revelation was received. He taught the brethren uh, that the New Jerusalem is not in Missouri, it turns out. It's in North and South America. It turns out the Lord had bigger plans. It's, it's, it's bigger than one little city. It's bigger than... Right? So it gets expanded in Nauvoo. And uh, we head over to Utah. And some people in Utah are saying, well, eventually when we're faithful, we're ready to live off consecration. We're going back to Missouri. Like, that's not true. That's not going to happen according to these revelations. Uh, it might happen because of future revelation. Uh, you, you never want to say something's never going to happen, but we are no longer obligated based on section 80, <coughs> 84 of building. Does that make sense? Because of section 124. So I'd make that clear with your students. Because uh, <coughs> you start getting into the Zion ideas, 
in the first half of the Doctrine and Covenants. It's exciting, and, and Missouri's the place, and we're going to gather out to the West, and we're going to be preserved uh, from all the destruction and the war and the calamity that's going to happen, because we're going to be all gathered together in New Jerusalem. Uh, turns out that all shifted right here in section 124. So just make sure you always keep that in the back of your mind as you're teaching and trying to apply those that first half of the Doctrine and Covenants. Word to the wise. All right, now let's go back to section 84. Section 84 of the Doctrine of Covenants. <clears throat> so, speaking of the building of the house of the Lord, so even though this temple is not built, this does lay the doctrinal foundation uh, and puts priesthood in its place in relation to the temple. It is very, very valuable. So, he says the glory of the Lord is going to fill the house. And the sons of Moses, verse 6, comma, according to the holy priesthood, which he received under the hand of his father-in-law Jethro, who then received under Caleb. And, uh, he cuts himself off mid-sentence of verse 6. Did you see that? And he doesn't pick up that idea until verse 31. Look at verse 31. <clears throat> anyway, therefore, as I said concerning the sons of Moses, uh, and then he gets back on track. So verses 6 through 30 are like this parenthetical. This aside, which is actually a super important aside because it explains the doctrine of the priesthood in connection to the temple. So the actual let's let's get the, the actual thought first, then we'll look at the parenthetical. Here's the thought. The thought is the whole the whole thought from verse six at thirty one and thirty two together is the sons of Moses and Aaron will offer an acceptable offering and sacrifice in the New Jerusalem temple and will be filled with the glory of the Lord in the Lord's house. That's the whole thought. Uh, notice that there's an acceptable offering and there's a sacrifice. Maybe that helps us understand what, why Joseph Smith taught two things. He's, perhaps the acceptable offering is the book of the records of our dead that Joseph talked about. And the sacrifice is animal sacrifice. Remember Elder Holland summarizing that and saying both of those will happen. Here's that quote again. Uh, it's both a book containing the records of our dead and, the, and animal blood sacrifice. So both of those will eventually come back and be performed in some temple somewhere at some time. Because uh, again, you'll even see awesome. people will slip this slip up in their in the writings way after Nauvoo and they'll say, when the Missouri temple's built, when the New Jerusalem temple is built, those offerings will occur. Just keep in mind the Lord rescinded that commandment, so it may be in Missouri, maybe not. Right? So, okay, now let's go look at the parenthetical, verses 6 through 30. He, talk, he drops Moses' line of authority, in 7 through seven, uh, 17 here, uh, we get the line of authority from Moses down to Adam. By the way, all those names that are mentioned there, uh, most of them are not mentioned in Scripture anywhere except for here. We know Jethro, we know who that was, he's mentioned in the Old Testament, but Caleb, that's not the Caleb that we know, like the Caleb and Joshua Caleb, that's a different guy. Uh, Elihu, we don't know who that is. Jeremy, don't know who that is. Gad, don't know who that is. Isaiah. Isaiah is another name for Isaiah, uh, and oftentimes Isaiah in like the Septuagint version, uh, when it's a different Isaiah than the Isaiah that's the Isaiah Isaiah, that's a different one. They'll use Isaiah in the Septuagint. Maybe Joseph's following that idea, saying this is his name was Isaiah, but it's a different Isaiah than the Isaiah. Uh, and then of course Abraham and Melchizedek are scriptural, and Noah and Enoch and Abel. But there's that group in the middle. We don't have them in scripture anywhere. So this is like pretty straight up revelatory, and we have no other. Uh, scriptural grounds to find those people or even know their stories at all. Um, this delineates how Moses came to note these verses. Verse 6, 18, 19, and 29. These are all equivalent terms. The holy priesthood. The priesthood after the holiest order of God. The greater priesthood and the high priesthood. Um, what, what phrase are we not using yet? Okay. We're, we're still not using Melchizedek priesthood, but, we're, but the ideas are definitely uh, all kind of clustered around this man, Melchizedek. Uh, section 76 did say priests after the order of Melchizedek, speaking of those who go to the celestial kingdom. So that's the closest we've gotten so far. Priests after the order of Melchizedek. But uh, he talks for just a second about Aaron. He says in verse 18 that the Lord confirmed a priesthood on Aaron and his seed. Now, we don't normally teach this about Aaron. Aaron's priesthood. Notice in verse 18. This is a priesthood that also continueth and abideth forever with the priesthood that's after the holiest order of God. This is also an eternal priesthood. Sometimes we say, well, it's, that's a priesthood. It's a temporary priesthood. It was part of a restriction. It's part of like a curse. Like 
when the high priest was taken away, the Lord had to come up with something. So we've got like a lesser priesthood, gave it to them. And then when Jesus returns, the second coming, that priesthood's going away or whatever. So we kind of come up with a story, don't we? Yes. That's not in the scriptures. It's opposite of what the scriptures saying. Verse 18 is saying, no, that's an eternal priesthood as well. So, so far, here's what we know. Sons of Moses and sons of Aaron. He's going to use this phrase back at verse 31, right? Sons of Moses, sons of Aaron. Sons of Moses are those who precede the holy priesthood or the high priesthood. It's without beginning of days or end of years. These are those who receive the lesser priesthood, it's called, which is also an eternal priesthood that, that continues forever. So, so far, that's all we know. Now let's go to the purposes of the greater priesthood, and we'll contrast those with the purposes of the lesser priesthood. Very interesting stuff. Are you interested? Yes. yes. Interesting. Okay, let's do this. So, 19 through 22. These are the go-to verses, right? You've had these quoted so many times in your life. Let's look at them in context, see if, they're, see if it tweaks our understanding or not. Let's see. This greater priesthood administereth the gospel. How's that different than preparatory gospel, which we're going to learn about in verse 26? His greater priesthood administers the gospel and holdeth the key of the mysteries of the kingdom. What's that mean? Even the key of the knowledge of God. What does that mean? Therefore, the ordinance is thereof of the higher priesthood. The power of godliness is manifest. What does that mean? And without the ordinances of the higher priesthood and the authority of the priesthood, the power of godliness is not manifest unto men in the flesh. What does that mean? Verse 22. For without this, no man can see the face of God. That's what that means. Even the Father and live. So the key of the knowledge of God, the key of, uh, of uh, receiving the power of godliness being manifest in your life is strictly and specifically talking about what? Seeing him. Actually coming into his presence and experiencing the power of godliness because you're in his presence, right? That's the context of these verses. Now, Moses tried to get that across to the Israelites. We have a little history, uh, history lesson here. Moses plainly taught this. Higher priesthood will help bring you into the presence of God. It's going to be great. In fact, you remember the Lord took them from the Red Sea instead of going right to the promised land of Canaan. Where does he take them? A little detour down to Sinai. Why did they need to go to Sinai before they get to the promised land? It's going to take 40 years. <laughs> well, only after the rebellion here. They were, they were, this was just it was supposed to happen right here. Sinai. Yeah, right? God wanted to bring them to Sinai into his presence. Right, verse 23. Let's go look at that. <coughs> Moses plainly taught this to the children of Israel in the wilderness, and he sought diligently to sanctify his people. Why? That they might behold the face of God. He wanted to bring them into the to see his face. And how did he plan on doing that? Get clean. Yeah. Joseph says, Moses sought to bring the children of Israel into the presence of God through the power of the priesthood priesthood was what was going to, through the ordinances thereof, was going to bring them into the presence of God. So were the Israelites going to uh, perform ordinances? That's right, yeah. So yeah, it was the highest and the holiest. Okay. <coughs> yeah. On the first tablet of place we learn in the JST of Exodus 34, it's in your like, back of the appendix, um, he is bringing the fullness of the priesthood ordinances, the things that would make you kings and priests and queens and priestesses Everything up to the, and through that. Temple covenants and temple ordinances. All of it, yeah. He's bringing that. And then they rebel. And then what does the Lord do? Look at verse 24. But they hardened their hearts, and they could not endure His presence. Therefore the Lord in His wrath, for His anger was kindled against them, swore that He should not enter. They should not enter into His rest. Well, in the wilderness which rest is the fullness of His glory. Therefore He takes Moses out of their midst. And the holy priesthood also. That's the high priesthood. We'll talk in just a second. What does that mean? What exactly did he, did he take away? Okay. So what is the purpose of the priesthood? To bring us into what? Presence of God. The presence of God. Actually see Him face to face. Can that happen in mortality? Or yes, is this just yes. about something in the future? After that, Not for sure. It can happen in mortality. Uh, second question. What is the purpose of the temple? provide a context where we can give the ordinances of the priest in order to bring us into the presence of God. So you can start to see the convergence, right? The doctrine of the priesthood and the doctrine of the temple is actually like in the, like you can't pull them apart from each other without damaging your understanding of the other one. And so uh, Mount Sinai actually becomes the prototype of all temples. In fact, look at this. Here's Sinai. This becomes prototypical of then the tabernacle with altar, outer court, holy place, holy of holies, 
So all temples ever after this, this is actually the very first temple ever built was this, patterned after the experience at Sinai. So every temple can be properly referred to as the mountain of, of the Lord. The mountain of the Lord's house was actually referring to the mountain of Mount Sinai. Ever after that, all temples have then been patterned to some degree after this experience. The idea is the same. It's always been this, and it will always be this. Moses is the first temple builder in the history of the world. Like no one ever built temples before him. Uh, they were always mountaintop experiences. But then we, come, we get a portable temple, right, with a journey coming from outside the outer world into the presence of God. What God's trying to do to us literally through these ordinances becomes symbolized. We kind of ritualize the process of coming into the presence of God through the temple ordinance. Right? It's a symbol that's supposed to prefigure a reality. Right? That's, that's what this is all about to get into the real presence of God. This has always been the goal. This has always been the pattern. Check out a few before Moses, not in temples, but in mountaintops. President Benson says, How did Adam bring his descendants into the presence of the Lord in Adam on Dion? The answer, Adam and his descendants entered into the priesthood order of God. Today we would say they went to the house of the Lord and received their blessings. Enoch followed this pattern, and he brought the saints of his day into the presence of God. Noah and his son Shem likewise followed the same pattern after the flood. Moses taught this order of the priesthood to his people, and he sought diligently to sanctify his people, quoting verse 23, that they might behold the face of God, but they hardened their hearts, and they could not endure his presence. Brigham Young said, If these children of Israel had been sanctified and holy, the children of Israel would not have traveled one year with Moses before they would have received their endowments and the Melchizedek priesthood. But they could not receive them and never did. Moses left them, and they did not receive the fullness of that priesthood. What didn't they receive? The fullness, the fullness of that priesthood. So did they receive some priesthood? Say yes. Yeah, did they receive the fullness of the priesthood? No. No. So in Nauvoo, Joseph will start to explain more what this means. He'll say, fullness of the priesthood means when you're actually, the moment you're actually ordained a king and a queen, or a priest and a priestess. That moment's when you get the fullness of the priesthood. Everything before that is preparatory. In fact, let me just take you on a little field trip. Put this in my supplemental material. I'm not sure if I was going to talk about this, but why the heck not? Here we go. Let's just talk about this. So before, before the uh, rebellion that verse 24 is talking about, with the, with the golden calf incident and all that, what happened before that? What was revealed? We got the Ten Commandments revealed prior to the golden calf. That's not a punishment. We get the covenant code about uh, how to live and act in society. That's up on Sinai before the golden calf incident. Uh, this is like laws about social justice and rights of the victim, etc. Uh, we get the preparatory gospel of repentance and baptism and carnal commandments. Uh, carnal commandments, by the way, are things like... Uh, give me the slide on this. Bouncing around here, but that's okay. So carnal commandments. Carnal is... A, a word for flesh. The law of carnal commandments is like commandments that are intended to help us learn to control our flesh, to develop self-control and self-discipline. So for example, these kind of commandments are the law of obedience and sacrifice, the law of the gospel, it's like repentance or taking care of the poor, kind of go back and forth on interpretations of what that means. Law of chastity is a carnal commandment. The law of consecration, carnal commandment, teaching to control and to, and to give of yourself. So those things, those carnal commandments, are, are already revealed during this time. Uh, then, Moses came down, and the people covenanted to live this in, in Exodus 24. He said, will you live this? And he said, yes. And he said, good, I'll go back and report. Chapter 25, he goes back up the mountaintop and reports, Lord, they're willing to live this. And he says, good, let me give you more. And he gives them specific instructions on how to build each aspect of the temple, the tabernacle. Instructions were then implemented later. Um, we'll get that program there. Mm -hmm. uh, in DNC 124, the Lord says, The reason I wanted Moses to build a temple was so that I could reveal additional ordinances that had been hid from before the, the world was. Whoa. So the purpose of the temple was what? It was to reveal ordinances to do what? Bring them into the presence, presence of God. Uh, you already saw that. Uh, specific instructions are then given on temple garments of Aaron and the priest, together with how to wash, anoint, and clothe them. And the instructions were implemented in 39 and 40. So here's the implementation, right? Uh, they had garments that looked something like that, at least the high priest did. If you weren't the high priest, you just had the white ones without the, 
the more elaborate ones. Um, you may have heard uh, this verse, so he instructed them to bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to wash them, to anoint them, and put on them uh, holy garments, uh, to sanctify them. Right? This, this was all instruction given prior to the golden calf incident. Uh, in our temples today we call washing, anointing, and clothing in the garment initiatory, right? preparatory. Elder Hale says these are preparatory ordinances. This is not the fullness of the priesthood, this is preparatory stuff. Uh, that's, that's right there. President David O. McKay said, what's it preparatory for? He actually said this outside the temple, so I liked it. He said, the anointing, we're anointed to become a king and a priest of the Most High, a queen and a priestess in the realms of God. I don't know how long it will take to achieve that, but we are anointed that we may become such at some future day. So this is preparatory to that day. Brigham Young says, those who come here in the temple and have received their washing and anointing will later be ordained kings and priests and will then have received the fullness of the priesthood, all that can be given on earth. The endowment itself, as we know it today, is not the fullness of the priesthood. Rather, as, as Harold B. Lee said, he said, the receiving of the endowment requires the assuming of obligations by covenants, which in reality are but an embodiment of, or an unfolding of the covenants each person should have assumed at baptism. He said, it's an unfolding of your baptismal covenants, the endowment is, right? Did you already promise to obey God when you got baptized? Sacrifice, live a lot of chastity, you did. But it unfolds it for, uh, for you in a little more specific way. Um, so, all these instructions were given prior to, prior to uh, the golden calf incident. Then comes the Melchizedek priesthood ordinances of the holy order, uh, the words of the everlasting covenant of the holy priesthood. This is the fullness of the gospel. This is enough to make a person a king and queen, priest and priestess. As he's receiving the highest ordinances ever offered to man, down at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> Right. <laughs> they're busting out. They're doing their golden calf stuff, right? Moses comes down the mountain holding these, right? And he sees them, right? And he's like, "Holy cow, you guys!" or something like that. And maybe he coined that phrase, right? He throws down the tablets, breaks them, right? Becoming the first person in the history of the world to break all the commandments at the same time. Uh, and he's like. Why? And so he goes back up the mountain later, right? After some things unfold there. And what does the Lord give him? Same things, but set for that. That's what verse 25 is talking about. He takes Moses out of their midst and the holy priesthood also. Do they continue to do washings, anointings, and clothing? Yeah, they still do that. Um, do they still go into the Holy of Holies once a year? If someone goes into the whole, or sorry, the holy place and the Holy of Holies once a year, yeah, that happens. Uh, they're still using the temple, but in a, in a more modified, ironic, priesthood, preparatory kind of way. All priesthood has to do with what? Temple, to some degree, to some way. Right? So here's what the ironic priesthood does in verse 26. So the lesser priesthood continued. Notice it wasn't given as a punishment. It continued, because it's eternal as well. Which priesthood holdeth the key of the ministering of angels and the preparatory gospel? Which gospel is the gospel of repentance, and baptism, and for the remission of sins, and the law of carnal commandments? Uh, now notice, let's see if we go back here. So, with this, let's, let's kind of summarize what we're learning here so far. Um... So I'm kind of compare and contrast these. So we've seen these two. Now the, the Melchizedek priesthood or sons of Moses administer the gospel and they hold the key of the mysteries of the kingdom, even the knowledge of God. Meanwhile, sons of Aaron administer the preparatory gospel and hold the key of the ministering of angels. These ordinances, uh, in, the, in, the, in the ordinances of this higher priesthood, the power of godliness is manifest and you're able to see the face of God. In the ordinances of this lower preparatory priesthood, we learn to subdue our flesh preparatory to meeting God. This is the preparatory time period. In the ordinances thereof, you will learn how to subdue your flesh and sanctify yourself in preparation for the future day when you can be called up and anointed right, and blessed with the fullness of the priesthood uh, at some future day. But So really, uh, it wasn't this, it doesn't look a whole lot different than uh, your or my temple experience today, right? We do a whole lot of preparatory stuff, uh, sanctifying ourselves in preparation for coming into the presence of 
the Father. We ritualize it, but we're uh, we're all preparing still for that. Yeah. The Aaronic priesthood is uh, eternal. Yeah. But its focus is on preparation. Yeah. What, what's its purpose eternally? Is that saying that people will have the Aaronic priesthood in, in forever after kingdom. they're resurrected? What's your understanding of what that means? I would probably, i just take my own stab at it, would be uh, it's eternal in that it's necessary on all worlds and always will be forever, but in the celestial realm, yeah, you're, Doesn't seem like it. once you're sanctified and the purpose has been achieved. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it will be eternal because it will always be needed as the purposes of God and the gods roll forward forever. What's your understanding of holding the key of the ministry of angels? Yeah, so that's, that's, uh, so Joseph taught that uh, the key of the ministry of angels, as, as the temple was going up in Nauvoo, we talked about this a little bit in DNC 13, uh, he said, I'm going I'm to give you a key, I'm going to teach you some keys by which you can recognize uh, true messengers from false ones. Um, in fact, right after he got the Aaronic priesthood, he's from John the Baptist. Then the devil appeared on the shores of the Susquehanna River to try to deceive them as an angel of light. And Michael came and taught them how to detect the devil and rebuke them. Um, so we read that in the context of the key of the ministry of angels. It's not the key to call angels to you, but it's the key to detect true messengers from false mm -hmm. ones. Um, is kind of the way Joseph teaches yeah, it. I feel like that's misunderstood. Yeah. Yeah, yeah context matters. Right? Context matters a lot. Um, yeah, and as you think about your experience in the endowment, remember where you're at in the priesthood when you learn that? <coughs> then that would be solidified in your mind, or if it's ironic. Um, so then he talks just for a moment about John the Baptist. As a descendant of Aaron, he was sent to do what? A preparatory work. He was actually a descendant of Aaron. He was actually called to prepare people to come into the presence of Christ. Um, and so that's talked about momentarily there. Uh, verse 28 and 29, he just drops this, maybe because it doesn't fit anywhere else. He says, all right, so speaking of these priesthoods, uh, Stephen, we talked about this a few weeks ago. There's the high priesthood and the lesser priesthood. At this time, if you were... If you had been ordained to the high priesthood, then you were a what? A high priest. If you were ordained to the priesthood, then you were a priest. Because it's the hood of priests. It's the, it's the, uh, it's like the brotherhood, the fraternity of those who are. So hood means like fraternal group. So it's the group of priests. And then you have these appendages. So this is how section 84 outlines priesthood offices up to that. Uh, point. So bishop today, what do we say bishop is? Bishop is an appendage of, or it's an office in. Right, we go there. So that's an interesting story to kind of tease out and study a little bit um, about how the office of bishop is kind of, kind of straddles both worlds. Okay, meanwhile, uh, we're back now. We've made through the parenthetical. Now we're back to verse 31 where he finishes the thought they're going to offer an acceptable offering. The sons of Moses and Aaron are going to make an offering in the New Jerusalem temple, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Whew. And then he says, since we're talking about that, let's talk about... Let's watch, the, watch the flow here. The sons of Moses and of Aaron shall be filled, verse 32, with the glory of the Lord upon Mount Zion in the Lord's house, whose sons you are. And also many whom I have called and sent forth to build up my church. For, then he explains about who is the sons of Moses and Aaron. And uh, we've come to know these verses as the oath and covenant that belongeth to the priesthood. Okay, do you have stamina to walk through this with me? You okay, how are you feeling? Step up, stay in the wind. Okay, good. Uh, all right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, that's not nice. You know, sometimes we all struggle with various things, okay? Uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes there's health concerns. Why don't we just cover the other Yeah, thing? yeah, let's just go, let's just go. <laughs> Verse 33. Um, okay, let's walk through this carefully. Whoso is faithful unto the obtaining these two priesthoods of which I have spoken. Do we know which two priesthoods they are? Yes, we do. Uh, and the magnifying their calling 
are sanctified by the Spirit unto the renewing of their bodies. Okay, let's break that down. Um, sanctified by the Spirit to the renewing of their bodies. Brother McCockey says, that is, they are born again. They become alive in Christ. They are new creatures of the Holy Ghost. They become the sons of God and thus join heirs with Christ. Uh, renewed in the Spirit. And that comes up in the next verse, verse 34. By the way, magnifying calling does not mean like callings that you're given by your bishop. This is the calling of uh, as being one of a member of God's covenant people and being the house of Israel, the general calling that we have to assist in his work in preparing the world for his return. It's like that calling. If you're a true and faithful, now all your sub callings can be like, you know, subsidiaries of that bigger calling. What does God want you to do right now to help with that? You know, that kind of plugs in. But this calling is talking about the, the calling that, that comes to those when you're baptized into the church and you receive uh, you, you receive the commission of the covenant people at that time right, to help out in God's work. Um, they become the sons of Moses and Aaron and the seed of Abraham. That is, they become heirs of the promises made to the fathers. The promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob about their seed and their posterity. So at this point, it seems like We've made marriage covenants right here, right? Marriage covenant has been made. This is my best my best guess at what verse 19 was talking about when it says the greater peace priesthood administers the gospel, but the lesser priesthood administers the preparatory gospel. Preparatory gospel, faith, repentance, baptism. Uh, it seems like this this gospel talked about in 19 would would be so when Elias comes to the curtain of the temple and restores the keys of the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, he restores the marriage covenant. And so perhaps that's what verse 19 is. That's my own stab, my, my own swing at the meaning of verse 19 when it says the greater priesthood administers the gospel and the lesser priesthood does the preparatory gospel. What's beyond preparatory? It seems like marriage is the next order up. You have Aaronic order and you've got this patriarchal order. The patriarchal order, uh, Joseph talks about it as the gospel of Abraham. So maybe that's what we're talking about. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Maybe. They also become the church and the kingdom and the elect of God. Church and kingdom and elect of God. I'm highlighting church and kingdom here. And I want to compare that to these verses in section 76. Speaking of those who are exalted. They are they into whose hands the Father has given all things. They are they who are priests and kings who have received of his fullness and of his glory. So priest is connected to church, and kings is obviously connected to kingdom. Priests and kings, church and kingdom. Priest is an ecclesiastical term. Kingdom is more of a political term, probably talking about family government. Whether or not your kids want to call you that. Okay. But it's kind of that idea. When you become the, king, the, 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 the kings and the leaders. And the elect of God, I would tie to the phrase, those who have received of his fullness. So if you catch the, in verse 33, it says, magnifying your calling. In verse 34, it calls you, uh, these, these people, the elect of God. Uh, the calling and the election by verse 34 seem to have been made what? Sure. Because of the promises that now follow. Those who are kings and priests unto God are those who've received the fullness of the priesthood. And so that's all right there embedded. This is not a later Nauvoo development in Joseph Smith's mind. It's already there. 1932, right in section 76, which he will like unpack in Nauvoo, but you see the seeds right there. So we have some equivalent terms fullness of the priesthood, kings and queens, priests and priestesses, calling election being made sure. These are equivalent terms. One who's in this condition is now authorized to come into the presence of God. Kind of like when you're baptized and an Melchizedek priesthood uh, holder says, Receive the Holy Ghost. Once you're at this position, now the command is. Now you can receive the Father and the Son. Now that, that's not one in the same moment, but now you are authorized to do so. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Oh, I'll wait till the break. Okay. It gives me a chance to drink with you. You're gonna wait? <laughs> no, I'll wait till the break. You're gonna wait till the break. You don't want it on camera? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let that be noted, public. <laughs> <laughs> DNC, yeah, uh, 8435. All those who receive this priesthood receive me. What does it mean to receive this priesthood? Well, the next verse tells you what that means. For he that receiveth my servants receiveth me. This is interesting. 
Those who receive this priesthood, or in other words, those who receive my servants, receive me. Note how this shifts the focus away from ordination and toward ordinances that his servants offer people. So, what does that do to our understanding? You can compare this with section 39. Right, those who receive me, he that receives my servants receives me. I will give as many as will receive me power to become my sons. And how do we receive Jesus? He says, by receiving my gospel. How do we do that? By getting baptized, receiving the Holy Ghost, etc. Under the hands of his servants, right? So receiving me equals receiving my servants, which equals receiving the ordinances of the gospel from my servants. Shifting our direction away from ordination to ordinances. Is that a big deal? That's a big deal, guys. <laughs> that is a bit. Why is that a big deal? Someone explain why this is a big deal. Big shift. The oath and covenant of the priesthood is relevant to who? Us. Male and female. That's the big insight here, right? That's why I got the lady. That's the big deal. Right. Yeah. That's right. So, is the oath and covenant bound only to men? Say no. No. No, right? So this is not something that... Uh, can I cue you in on like, a little, little, like, little insider scoop here? Turns out, the more you study this, oath and covenant of the priesthood is a synonym for new and everlasting covenant. What? <laughs> <laughs> if you receive my servants and receive the ordinances of the priesthood all the way to the end until you get the fullness of the priesthood, then kings and... Queens, priests and priestesses will be together with the Father. Notice the promises that happen next. As you receive the priesthood ordinances, then you become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You receive me, he says. And as you receive me, then you receive what? For who? The Father. And when you receive the Father, now you're talking, now you're in the presence of the power of godliness. Now the power of godliness is manifest in your life. And those who receive the Father receive all that my Father has. Right? We all we inherit all things as members of God's family and kingdom. That is not a male centered blessing. This is men and women receiving the ordinances, receiving the servants, receiving Christ through all of that. Right? And uh, so that the shift from ordination to ordinances I think is huge and it needs to be articulated to our students. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Yeah, that's that's a big deal. Thoughts, comments, questions about that. Yes. I think it's interesting in the language of when we were um, we uh, do the ordinance of confirmation where you say receive the Holy Ghost, which is very similar to what you have written there, which is very similar to what you have written there. All the Godhead. Receive the Holy Ghost, receive Jesus Christ, receive the Heavenly Father. Awesome. That's a great framing. I never thought about that. I like that. It's cool. I like that a lot. Then what happens if you receive all these promises? Well, next verse is 39 and 40. Then the Father makes an oath and a covenant with you. He says basically, those who have done 33 through 37, now the promise of 38 is yours. That's the oath. That's the covenant. Verse 38 will happen for you. You will receive all that I have. That is, a, that is the oath and covenant. The Father says you will have it. If the Father himself tells you, you will receive all that I have. Then your calling election has been made. Sure. Which then makes us what? The next verses are scary. Those who have been so promised are now candidates of perdition. He tells us in verse 41, right? Have you ever been confused by 41? There's many a Doctrine and Covenant student that's been confused by 41. Whoever breaks this covenant after he's received it and altogether turneth therefrom shall not have forgiveness of sins in this world nor in the world to come. It seems harsh for not doing your own teaching, you know, kind of thing. Uh, it's like, man, I know some people that are kind of inactive, and that's, whoo. Right. Is that what he's talking about? He's talking about that group? No. He's talking about the group that have had the Father say to them, you will receive all that I have, because you have received my servants, you've received my son, I now promise to give you all that I have. It's when the Father makes an oath with you. Then verse 41 can apply, but before that, Everything's preparatory before that. How are you going to teach this to your teenage students? Mm -hmm. You're going to do so good, guys. You're going to do really good. <laughs> I have great confidence in you. Uh, you really just need that big deal thing. Do you need that thing? Big deal. Big deal alert. So, 
Verse 42, Woe unto all those who don't come unto this priesthood. Do not come to these ordinances. Do not receive my servants. Therefore, don't receive me. That's a problem. You guys who are with me today, you 11, good job. You've done it so far. But I want to give you some help to stay strong. The rest of this section we're going to go a little faster through. But that, that first part is pretty dense, right? Um, he says, let me give you guys a command for your spiritual safety. 42 through 44. Uh, beware concerning yourselves. Watch out for yourself. Give heed to the words of eternal life. Diligent heed. Live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. That's going to be your safety and your protection. And then he starts outlining how God's going to initiate the process of bringing all mankind into the covenant uh, promises. He talks about the light of Christ that's given to everyone in the world. Helps them to respond to the, the voice of God, the voice of the Spirit. And then come into the Father, verse 48. Then the Father will teach them of the covenant which he's renewed and confirmed upon you. Uh, if people don't respond to the covenant, that's how you know they're in the bondage of sin. And the world right now is lying in iniquity. That's why I need you, elders. That's why I need you, high priests. That's why I need you to proclaim the gospel. He explains why the church is under condemnation and how to get out of it, especially those in Zion, those in Missouri. He says, you guys are, are uh, in a problematic situation. If the way to safety is to give heed to every word that comes out of my mouth, why is God angry with them? Why are they under condemnation, potentially? Because they have neglected and treated lightly the Book of Mormon and the former commandments that he's given to other parts of the DNC. You have treated them lightly, and as such, you have brought yourself under condemnation. And if you don't repent, uh, then comes the scourge. He'll warn them later. Uh, verse 59, For shall the children of the kingdom pollute my holy land? Verily I say unto you, nay, that's specifically talking to the people in Missouri. You guys are neglecting what I've given you. You are doing a good job talking about it, but that's not why I gave you Scripture, verse 57, right? I want you to not only say, but do according to that which I've written. That's why I gave it to you. So you would act on it. Act on it. As you act on truth, that's when it will sanctify you. Talking about it, that's not going to do it. That's not why I gave it to you. The United outlines a lot of verses 60 through 93, both the message and the method that the Lord's servants uh, are to use and to, to proclaim to the world. That's all set forth clearly there. Uh, we won't take the time to go into all the details of that. Uh, woes are pronounced upon the cities and villages that reject the Lord's servants because they don't come into the covenant. They don't come into the oath and covenant of the priesthood ever. Millennial blessings and a new song are set forth. Those who are going out and proclaiming the gospel, you're preparing people for the millennial day where we can all sing this new song. And he, he puts the lyrics there, maybe in the new hymn book. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe verses 99 good. through 102 will be, if not in this next version of the hymn book, at least in the millennial hymn book, it's going to be there. And that is, he's, we've already got the lyrics, we just got to learn the tune. Right? You know the song, but do you hear the music? <laughs> so much to give a general conference to talk about that. Uh, additional counsels given to Lord's servants who travel. And then uh, one more piece here. Specific instructions given to Newell K. Whitney. He's supposed to go to, look at verse 114, New York, uh, this, this New York City, Albany, and Boston, and warn the people there of the desolation and utter abolishment that will come upon them if they do not repent. And and then uh, he goes back to more general terms, and then he ends. That is uh, 120 verses, uh, all eventual, starting out with temple and priesthood doctrine. And then once that foundation is firmly laid, then he says, he puts their missions into relevant context, right? That's why I need you guys to go out and preach the word. But you yourselves aren't taking my word very seriously. I need you to take my word seriously, act on it, become sanctified, go out and invite others to come into this covenant. And as you do so, the world will be prepared to sing the new song in the millennial day, uh, which will be the great day of the second comforter. Right? That's the great day when people get to come into the presence of God. And you know, the majority of us will probably come into the presence of God in that day. Uh, so, powerful, powerful section. Good luck teaching that.